My name is Michelle Carr, and I'm an educator here at the North Carolina Museum of History. I want to welcome you to tonight's presentation on Jim Thorpe, North Carolina baseball, and the 1912 Olympic scandal. Our special guest tonight is going to be Dr. Matthew Andrews. Before we begin, I just want to share with you that this is my first time serving as both the host and the manager of a webinar. So I want to thank you in advance for your patience with me as I go through this learning process. I also want to let you know that we are recording tonight's program, and it will be available for viewing on the, muse on the museum's YouTube channel in just a few weeks. Get a chance for us to edit it and make sure all our captions are working, and then we can share that with you. So without any further ado... I am going to introduce our special guest for tonight. Yeah, oh, there we go. <laughs> Tonight's speaker is Professor Matthew Andrews, a teaching associate professor and a departmental advisor in the College of Arts and Sciences History Department at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He specializes in the link between sports and American culture, and he is particularly interested in the way sports both reflect and affect American politics, race and gender identities, as well as social reform movements. In addition to his academic responsibilities, Dr. Andrews hosts a popular podcast, American Sport with Matt Andrews. Each episode explores the sporting events that have defined our culture and changed the course of American history. I'm going to have to add that to my podcast list. Start All right. checking that out. After his presentation tonight, Dr. Andrews has been kind enough to agree to take questions from the audience. Uh, We'll have about 15 to 20 minutes for your questions. If you'd like to send them to us, we'd love to hear from you. Please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to share your questions with us. And now I am sure that our viewers are as eager and curious as I am to learn about the connections between Jim Thorpe, North Carolina, and an Olympic scandal. So I'm turning the floor over to you, Dr. Andrews. Okay, great. So I'm going to share this here. You'll have to excuse me. I'm using a computer as um, we were talking about that I don't know how to use very well. Um, and I'm having one little issue here. So bear with me. And uh, I actually do know how to use a computer. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry for this. Uh, give me one second here. Okay. You yep. should have the host function. Yep. Got it. So I'm sharing screen there. I want to share that. And I'll share that. And then what I'm trying to do is make this full screen. And I'm having a little bit of trouble with it. But here we go. I think I figured it out. Yeah, so while I'm doing this, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Matthew Andrews. Yeah, I'm a, um, Michelle, thank you for that introduction. Yeah, I teach courses at the University of North Carolina on, on, on sports and, and, and politics. And this is great being on on Zoom, even though I was obviously having some some trouble there, um, you know, I, I I enjoy being in the classroom. I took two classes today. I had like 250 students in each each class, and it was a lot of fun. But what I like about this is that people from all over can can join. So thank you very much for for being with me here. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the Olympic Games. I'm guessing that some of you watched some of the recent Paris uh, Games. Um, I had the privilege of attending the Paris Games with 20 UNC undergraduates. Uh, for a study abroad course that I was that I was leading, and one of the events that we went to was was volleyball. We had random tickets for indoor volleyball, and the the, the match we saw was Poland against Italy. And um, one of the things that struck me about both teams actually were the number of black players for both countries, especially Poland. And so watching these players represent Poland, it really made me have to. Uh, adjust my thoughts and my ideas about what Polishness is, about Polish identity. And that's what this lecture is about. Um, to, not about Polish identity, but it's about uh, the great American athlete Jim Thorpe and how he and other Olympians sort of did and did not challenge the idea of what an American, what a real American is through their participation. And let's just get this out in the open right now. The idea that a that a Native American athlete would prompt some Americans to reassess their idea of what an American is, is very ironic. Uh, but what I thought I would do this evening is, is um, trace the changing complexion and composition of the United States Olympic team uh, early on, and then place Thorpe and a few other athletes in that story. And then we'll wrestle with the scandal that Jim Thorpe got caught up in. This is a scandal that has its roots in North Carolina. I'll talk about 30, 
35 minutes. Um, and I hope we can have a, a robust conversation uh, through through Q&A. That is always my, my favorite part of these talks. So um, let's get grounded here. Uh, the modern Olympic movement had its origins in Paris in 1894. This is when and where a man named uh, Pierre de Coubertin created the International Olympic Committee. Um, he gathered a few dozen men like him, men who were interested in sports, upper class men, and they created the IOC. This organization still runs the Olympics today. And it was here in the Sorbonne in 1894 that they made two really important decisions about the Olympics moving forward. Um, decision number one here was they decided that all athletes had to represent nations, which is not how it has to be. You know, athletes could compete just as individuals at the, the, the Olympic Games. Think how different that would be. Uh, but the IOC, they wanted flags and national identities at their games. And so the Olympics e instantly became a theater or a, or a show place for both national identity and international rivalries. We could talk about whether this is good or whether this is bad or or, or maybe neither. Uh, but one outcome of this is that it definitely caused Americans to root for athletes they might not otherwise root for in the name of patriotism, in the name of nationalism. You know, think Jesse Owens, Americans rooting for Jesse Owens, the black sprinter in Berlin in 1936. Maybe uh, a lot of white Americans who might otherwise not root for the for a black athlete. We're definitely rooting for Owens or Jim Thorpe in Stockholm in 1912, and we are we are getting there. Okay, the other decision made here in 1894, and this decision also has an effect on our story, was that all Olympic athletes had to be amateurs. Amateurism was a mid 19th century idea that came from England, and it was really based on the idea that money ruins sports. You know, you compete in sports to develop mind and body and soul. You don't compete in sports for money. Indeed, the adherents of amateurism believe that once money was introduced into the equation, it ceased being sport at all. It became labor. And it also brought in a win at all costs mentality, which they thought sports was not supposed to be about. So you play sports simply for the love of sport. And that's actually where the word amateur comes from. It's a it's a French word. Uh, it's derived from the Latin root to love, like amore or uh, amorous. So an amateur is someone who does something for the love of it, but right? not to get paid for it. So that was the rule at the Olympic Games from the very start. That is the rule at the Olympic Games all the way until 1992. So almost for a full century, amateur athletes only. And so the rule is this. Anyone who at any time made money competing in sports, any sports, are they are ineligible to compete at the Olympic Games. We're going to see how that comes into play later. You know, amateurism is an idea that is only recently being unraveled, like in, on the American college sports scene. And I know a lot of people who think that the introduction of money, the introduction of things like name, image, and likeness, uh, that that's ruining college sports. So these ideas about... Um, about the, the, the disconnect between sport and money, these ideas still per, persist. Maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A as well. Okay, the first of these modern Olympic Games took place in Athens, Greece in 1896. And this was fitting as this was essentially uh, the site of the ancient Olympics. They too had been in Greece, so they were in Olympia, uh, not in Athens. And I want to say something quickly here about the U.S. team, the first American Olympic team. So 14 nations sent representatives, and the United States was one of them, and the U.S. sent 14 athletes. And they almost all of them came from the elite Eastern colleges, from schools like Harvard and Yale and Princeton, or the elite athletic clubs in the Northeast, like the New York Athletic Club or the Boston Athletic Club. These were the young men who had the time, they had the means, they had the money to travel to Greece for these games, because that's how it worked for these first games. You had to pay your way over there and enter the games. Your nation did not just send you. The American Olympic team in 1896 then, it was all white. It was all men of means. And it was white, upper-class athletes. And I should mention all male as well. Women were not allowed to compete in the first Olympic Games. It's not until Paris 1900 that the IOC actually allows that. The American contingent was led by William Milligan Sloan. He was a Princeton history professor. He was a professor of the ancient world, so they thought he'd be apt for the job. He was a lover of sport. He was the founding force behind the American Olympic Committee, which today is called the United States Olympic and Paralympic 
Committee. He's the organization's first president. And as a historian, I love this, a history professor as the head of the AOC. I mean, sign me up. Um, here are some of the American athletes that he escorted to Athens. Note their different national uniforms. Athletes brought their own uniforms. And we can see here, they all have the American flag on their uniform, at least most of them. Um, but they don't just represent the stars and stripes. They are representing their college here as well. On the left is Ellery Clark, a Harvard student, and he's hosting, he's um, uh, um, sporting both the American flag and the Harvard flag on his uniform. The athletes on the right over there are all from Princeton, and their Princetonness is being uh, identified by that black uh, sash on their uniforms. So it's very much country and college here in 1896. This is a reminder, I think, of how closely sports were linked in the college system in the United States. At these 1896 Olympic games, just so you know, the very first event was the triple jump, back then known as the hop, skip, and the jump, uh, the winner. And so this was the very first Olympic champion was the American James Connolly uh, from Harvard, but representing the Suffolk Athletic Club here. For winning the contest, Connolly was awarded a silver medal. That's what the winners were, were given at these first Olympic Games, a, a silver medal. And the United States won 11 silver medals in all, and that was the most of, of any nation. One last thing to briefly mention here, and I think this is worth mentioning, certainly because of our topic tonight. The uh, Greeks tried to make sense of the success of the U.S. athletes. And in doing so, they resorted to some pretty toxic stereotyping. One Athens newspaper described American athletes like this. The Americans have joined the inherited athletic training of the Anglo-Saxon with the wild impetuosity of the redskin. In other words, take a little bit of white, civilized European and mix in some quote unquote savage Indian. And you have a new type of super modern athlete, you know, both kind of rational and wild all at the same time, a, a Tarzan, if you will. You know, it's interesting to see how other nations perceive American athletes. One of the reasons why I shared this. And of course, there is a Native American theme to our lecture today. The first Olympic Games to take place in the United States were these, the 1904 St. Louis Olympics. So eight years after those Athens Games. And I think we need to talk about something that happened at these games to make sense of the radical meaning of Jim Thorpe. These 1904 St. Louis Olympics were a sideshow. You can see it here in the poster to a, a, a World's Fair, the 1904 World's Fair celebrating the centennial of the Louisiana Purchase. It's actually 101 years after the Louisiana Purchase. These games, the American, the first American Olympic Games were organized by uh, America's number one believer in, in amateurism, James Sullivan. James Sullivan was the head of the Amateur Athletic Union, and he's one of the main characters in this lecture. And the 1904 Games were to be his pageant for American amateurism. He wanted to use these games to demonstrate the superiority of American athletes. And James Sullivan got his wish at these games. Uh, American athletes won 70 of the 94 gold medals. And it's actually here in 1904 that they started giving out gold medals to the winners for the first time. But here's one reason why the United States won so many medals. There were 645 athletes at these games and 524 of them were from the United States. And most of the rest were all from Canada. There was no French team, no Italian team, no Scandinavian presence whatsoever. St. Louis, it turns out, was just too far. Uh, from the rest of the world to for the rest of the world to journey to is much too far from a major ocean port. Among the American athletes uh, of note here in 1904 was George Pogue. He's the first African American athlete to compete at the Olympic Games. Pogue was a sprinter from the University of Wisconsin, and here in uh, St. Louis, he won bronze medals in both the 200 and the 400 meter hurdles. So the complexion and the constitution of the American Olympic team is beginning to change here in 1904. But here's what I really want to emphasize about 1904. James Sullivan and the Olympic organizers were looking for ways to spice up their games, to, to increase interest in the games that had suddenly lost their international flair because no one else came to the Olympics. And here's what James Sullivan came up with. And I got to warn you, this is not pretty. When athletes from other nations did not come to St. Louis, James Sullivan had another idea. And this might be the most unfortunate moment in American sports history and in Olympic sport history. 
James Sullivan came up with a sports competition that was called Anthropology Days. That was his term, Anthropology Days. It was also more familiarly called Savages Day. Here's what happened here. As I said, the St. Louis Olympics were part of a larger World's Fair. Well, one of the exhibits at this fair, and I'm not kidding here, uh, one of the exhibits at this fair was what is essentially a human zoo, a zoo with human beings in it. This was a collection of exhibits in which so-called primitive people, and that's the word that the fair organizers used, primitive people from around the world lived in pens where they could be observed by the fairgoers. Exhibits like this human zoo were actually quite common at the turn of the 20th century, not only in the United States. If you look at World's Fairs in England and in France, in London and in Paris, they did the same thing. And the idea behind these exhibits was this. By displaying these people, the exhibits were meant to suggest the cultural superiority of the fairgoer, of the spectator. In this instance, it was, you know, look at those people in their straw huts and their animal skin loincloths, and look how civilized we Americans are by contrast. That was the idea. There were pygmies from Central Africa, Indians from the Southwestern United States and Mexico. There were Patagonians, there were Syrians, there were Hawaiians. You know, many of these people were from lands that had recently been occupied and conquered by, by, by the United States military. So we might even think of these human beings almost as, as uh, trophies from these conquests. Like this group. One group stands out here, I think, the Igorots from the Philippines. At that very moment, 1904, the American military was pacifying the Philippines uh, as part of the end of the Spanish-American War. The Americans who came to the fair were especially interested in seeing the Igorots, and that's because they heard a story that the Igorots ate dog meat. It turns out that back in the Philippines, the Igorots rarely ate dog meat, but it was not unheard of. It was like a delicacy. But then the story got out that the Igorots were dog eaters. So the city of St. Louis provided them with a supply of 20 dogs per week. And the fair organizers build the Igorot village as Dogtown. And just so you know, it was at this fair that a new uh, American food fad emerged. There was a German immigrant who was living in St. Louis. He took the traditional German bratwurst. He placed it in an open bun. And in honor of the Igorots, he called it the hot dog. That's where it comes from. Um, be like an Igorot and eat a hot dog. If you are like many of my students, this is the one thing you are going to remember from this lecture, though it's not the most important thing that I'm going to be saying today. But I know that's an interesting fact. Anyway, you're probably wondering, what does any of this have to do with the Olympics? OK, these exhibits at the fair were bad enough. But then the American sportsman James Sullivan had an idea. James Sullivan firmly believed that the white American athlete was at the top of the human hierarchy in both kind of brains and brawn. And now he was going to be denied the opportunity to prove American superiority because no one else was coming to the Olympics. So he thought, why not prove white American athletic superiority by demonstrating the athletic inferiority of those non-white, mostly non-American people? Let's have them play sports. And the anthropologists from the local universities, they can observe them. And so that's what the anthropology days were. They were the anthropological and the popular viewing of these people from around the world competing in both Olympic and non-Olympic events. And let me give you a sense of how poorly thought out the, anthropologies, the, the anthropology days were. They asked the competitors to play water polo, but they got to the pool and most of them refused to jump in. They didn't know how to swim like the American Indians from the Southwest. These people from around the world were asked to compete in sports they had never seen before. And so they did the high jump poorly. They threw the discus poorly for the javelin. They decided instead of a javelin, let's have them throw this like larger spear playing with stereotypes, I think, of African primitivism. The 100 meter dash was chaos with so many languages spoken. They had a hard time getting everyone set. And then the starter's gun scared most of these people. I mean, some of these people had probably been on the wrong end of American weaponry. They were all frightened. And then when the race began, none of the runners knew they were supposed to break through the tape at the end. So they all ducked under it. It was a farcical experiment. 
But here was the conclusion as printed in the official report of the St. Louis Games written by James Sullivan himself. The representatives of the savage and uncivilized tribes proved themselves inferior athletes. This was the scientific assessment, in quotes. And these events confirm James Sullivan's hypothesis. Yes, um, those quote unquote savages could throw a spear, but they could not play a proper game of tennis or throw a discus as far as a white man. Never mind that they had never seen a tennis racket or a discus in their entire life. But if playing skilled and agile tennis is your definition of what makes someone civilized, well, then these people were uncivilized. I mention all this right now because James Sullivan, with all of his ideas about amateurism, all his ideas about racial hierarchies and American identity, he is the one who is ultimately going to be the man who sits in judgment of Jim Thorpe, who I'm going to get to right now. There's Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe very well may be the greatest athlete in American history. Jim Thorpe was an American Indian from Oklahoma. When he was 16 years old, he was sent to the Carlisle Indian School, which was a boarding school in Pennsylvania for American Indians. And Carlisle was a school run by white philanthropists. It was a place where Indian children were taught the ways of white culture. The idea was that here at Carlisle, the wild Indian would become civilized. He would be taught English, mathematics, proper manners. Uh, kill the Indian and save the man. That was literally the motto at Carlisle. And one of the ways you killed the Indian and made him American, again, the irony, was by teaching him sports, sports like football and baseball, right? If you want to turn a so-called wild Indian into a real American, teach him to play baseball, teach him to play football. So sport was being used here as a tool for assimilation. It was at Carlisle that Jim Thorpe drew the attention of a very famous football coach, Glenn Pop Warner. Pop Warner was both the track coach and the football coach at, at Carlisle. And at first, he didn't want Thorpe to play football because he was the school's best track athlete. He didn't, didn't want Thorpe to injure himself. But Thorpe was just too good to keep off the football field. And in 1911, uh, Thorpe led Carlisle, the Carlisle Indians, to a pretty shocking upset over Harvard which is one of the college football powers back then. Thorpe could do it all. He was a collegiate All-American in track and field, in football, in baseball, in lacrosse. I have seen it in print, but can't confirm this fact, but I have read that Jim Thorpe was a collegiate national champion in ballroom dancing. Amazing if true. He's still amazing, even if it's not true. So Americans were reading about Thorpe, this athlete doing amazing things at Carlisle. They were becoming interested in this athlete that the press usually just called the Indian. In the 1912 Summer Olympics in Stockholm, Sweden, this American Indian became an international sports star when he easily won both the pentathlon and the decathlon, five event and 10 event competitions. Uh, track and field competitions. And Thorpe dominated these events like like no man ever had. Um, I've got this photograph here that I want to highlight, this uh, iconic photo, we'll see it many times tonight, of a supremely confident Jim Thorpe. This was taken during the decathlon. And maybe you know this story. Look, look at his shoes. Someone took Jim Thorpe's track shoes during the decathlon, maybe on purpose, maybe by mistake. We don't really know. But no matter... Jim Thorpe found these two mismatched shoes that didn't really even fit him very well in a trash can. He put them on and he rode them all the way to the gold medal. Uh, Jim Thorpe was just unstoppable. When King Gustav of Sweden presented Thorpe with his medals for both the pentathlon and the decathlon, he told Thorpe, sir, you are the greatest athlete in the world. Jim Thorpe said, thanks, King. Or at least that's the story that the American press told. It's a it's a story suggesting Jim Thorpe's simplicity, I think. There's a debate about whether or not Thorpe did or did not say, say that. For the record, Jim Thorpe always said, I did not say that. I just said thank you. It's another interesting photo, right? Back then it was different. The king and not the athlete got to stand on the podium when awarding medals. 
Upon returning to the United States, Thorpe was celebrated as a national hero. He was greeted with a parade in New York City, and he had represented the United States on the athletic field of battle, and he had succeeded magnificently. And then Thorpe just kept going. He further enhanced his athletic reputation by leading Carlisle to the national championship in football that, that fall. This was a football season that included a shocking upset over Army. Army was a football powerhouse, and they were a team led by a pretty tough linebacker and running back named Dwight David Eisenhower. That's him at the bottom left there, the man who would obviously later become president of the United States. You know, sometimes sports can be so symbolic, and this is one of those cases. It had been the fathers of the Army players who had routed the fathers of the Carlisle Indians and conquered the American West for white America, for United States America. So this football game in 1912 was very much thought of as symbolic revenge. To go back to Jim Thorpe's Olympic triumphs, Jim Thorpe helped redefine the idea of what an American athlete was, well, what he looked like. He was not like the young men who had represented the United States at those first Olympic Games just 16 years earlier, upper-class white men of privilege, Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Thorpe, you know, the entire 1912 Olympic team was much more diverse. It was much more representative of the American population. And not only Thorpe, I want to mention a few of the other athletes on that team. There was Louis um, Tiwanima of the Hopi tribe in the Southwest. Uh, Tiwanima was a Carlisle man also. He went to Carlisle. He, and he won silver in the 10,000 meter uh, run here in, in Stockholm. This is actually a photo of him in the marathon. There was the great swimmer from Hawaii, Duke Kahanamaku, one of the great swimmers in U.S. history. Also, the man credited with introducing surfing to the mainland United States. Kahan uh, excuse me, Kahanamaku won gold for the United States in the 100 meter freestyle. There was Andrew Sokalexis from the Penobscot Indian tribe in Maine. Sokalexis was a marathoner. He just missed meddling in Stockholm. He came in fourth. And there were also some soon-to-be-famous white athletes on this American team as well. I think this is worth, worth mentioning. These two guys, Avery Brundage was a fellow decathlete with Jim Thorpe. He actually dropped out during the competition in 1912, went to his grave saying it was one of his great regrets that he did fight to the finish. Uh, but he's going to go on to become the president of the IOC for 20 years, from 1952 to 1972, other than Pierre Coubertin, who um, created the modern Olympic movement. He's probably the most important person in that movement. Also on the American team was George S. Patton, who competed not in the pentathlon, but in the modern pentathlon, which was a like a soldier's Olympic competition that included shooting and running and equestrianism. Patton actually took opium as a pain reliever uh, in these competitions. Uh, maybe not surprisingly, he also failed the medal. So it was a diverse team. And some Americans celebrated, very explicitly celebrated this athletic diversity. You know, uh, for example, Edward Baird Moss uh, called athletes like Thorpe and Kahanamaku America's athletic missionaries. You know, they were evidence that anyone could make it big in the United States. They were proof to the rest of the world that the United States of America was truly the land of opportunity. The president of the American Olympic Committee in 1912 um, was a man named R. Uh, M. Thompson, Colonel R. N. Thompson, excuse me. In an article, this article right here that he wrote for the New York Times, he said that the 1912 team was evidence of a new American race. You can see the uh, subheadline there. Work done at Stockholm shows that our race is not losing stamina, but out of our mixed blood has arisen a compound that is invincible or may be made so. Uh, Thompson said, you know, what this team is, we have Irish and Germans and Jews and American Indians and Black athlete and Hawaiians, but they have fused together to create the greatest Olympic team in history. This right here is an early celebration of the democratic potential of sport and a very early celebration of American athletic diversity. In fact, it's going to be really almost another half century before, an Amer before Americans largely accept the idea, even then. A lot of them don't, but accept the idea of, 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 of diverse, integrated um, athletics. So some celebrated Jim Thorpe, 
and other athletes of color for their accomplishments. But Jim Thorpe was a problematic figure for James Sullivan and for some of the other upper class leaders of the American Olympic movement. They had a vision of the ideal American athlete. Uh, and that was a vision of a white, middle or upper class Protestant man. So when the first American athlete to attract international attention was an American Indian. Well, let's just say that Sullivan and others, they were ambivalent about this. Um, Thorpe was not the poster boy for American sports that they envisioned. But what could they do? Well, just a couple of months after Thorpe's remarkable football victory over Army, there came an accusation and then evidence to support that accusation. In fact, Jim Thorpe admitted that he had done what I'm about to tell you. It was revealed that a couple of years earlier, in both 1909 and 1910, Jim Thorpe had been paid money to play baseball, minor league baseball in North Carolina. Thorpe played summer baseball, again, professional baseball in the Eastern Carolina League, he played for the Rocky Mount Railroaders and for the Fayetteville Highlanders. He did indeed do this. There are records of it. He earned $25 a week doing so. And unlike other college athletes and potential Olympians who wanted to safeguard their amateur status and gave a fake name when they did this, Jim Thorpe had not given a fake name. Jim Thorpe played as Jim Thorpe. The story broke in January of 1913, so about six months after the Olympics had finished. And it was just happenstance. There was a, a reporter for the Worcester Telegram in Massachusetts, and he just happened to be chatting with a friend of a friend who mentioned that he had coached Jim Thorpe three years earlier in North Carolina. He mentioned it merely to bask in the fact that he knew the great Jim Thorpe. And the reporter asked some questions, and he did some digging. He found the evidence, and he wrote the story. This was a scandal. Thorpe was not, by the rules of the IOC, an amateur. He and his coach, Pop Warner, they crafted a letter of admission, a letter of apology, admission and apology. Um, they crafted it to James Sullivan because he was the leader of the uh, Olympic movement in the United States. Here's it's a pretty long letter. Here's one of the things that Thorpe said or wrote. I never realized until now what a big mistake I made by keeping it a secret about my ball playing, and I'm very sorry I did so. I hope I will be partly excused by the fact that I was simply an Indian schoolboy and did not know all about such things. In fact, I did not know I was doing wrong because I was doing what I knew several other college men had done, except that they did not use their own names. There are a few problems, red flags with this statement. Uh, Thorpe was not really a schoolboy when he competed in Stockholm. He was 25 years old. So he was 22 and 23 when he played baseball. Most people think the letter was actually crafted by Pop Warner, his, his coach. And Warner leaned into the stereotype and played and played innocent, you know, as, as an Indian schoolboy. He had Jim Thorpe plead ignorant as an Indian schoolboy. Um, most people think that Pop Warner knew that Thorpe had played professional minor league baseball. We now know that Pop Warner himself paid his college athletes. He paid his football players, a direct um, contravention to the rules of amateurism. But Warner swore he did not know what Thorpe had, had done. Um, and I think he did Jim Thorpe a disservice um, with this, this statement here, suggesting that he was simply an Indian schoolboy. What would I know about anything? As the head of the AAU, James Sullivan was one of the men who was in charge of investigating and deciding what to do with Jim Thorpe. Another of the men of the prominent members of the American Olympic Committee was a magazine publisher named Casper Whitney. He once called any athlete, at, excuse me, any athlete who competed for money vermin. He once said it was beneath the dignity of white men to compete with athletes of color, Jim Thorpe being an athlete of color. Jim Sullivan and Casper Whitney, these are some of the guys in charge of the American Olympic Committee at this time, and it's in their hands that uh, rests um, Jim Thorpe's fate. Sullivan and Whitney and the committee moved with pretty incredible speed. They said that Thorpe had broken the sacred vow of amateurism. They ordered that he return his gold medals. 
And they suggested to the IOC that Jim Thorpe's name be removed from the Olympic record book. This was despite the fact that the Stockholm Olympic Committee had a rule that said they would only consider charges against athletes for 30 days after the Olympics. That deadline had long, long passed. Jim Thorpe's defenders charged that this was racism, is that a prominent white athlete would never have been punished so severely. I don't know. Um, but the decision was final. Jim Thorpe was stripped of his gold medals. Jim Thorpe is the first athlete to lose his medals for violating the IOC's rules of amateurism. He won't. Uh, well, others aren't going to have their medals taken. Others are going to be punished and be uh, ostracized from 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 the Olympics. Though I really want to emphasize the following. It was not the International Olympic Committee that demanded that Jim Thorpe return his medals. It was the American Olympic Committee. They are the ones who went after the after Thorpe, these two guys, and insisted that he give his medals back. It was the American Olympic Committee that ultimately saw Jim Thorpe as a problem. Once Jim Thorpe lost his amateur status, he left college. He played professional sports because Jim Thorpe could do anything. Jim Thorpe played six years of Major League Baseball, and then for two years, he was the most famous name in a brand new professional football league called the NFL. And kind of fun fact, good piece of trivia, Jim Thorpe is the first commissioner of the NFL. When the NFL started, they just wanted a name, a famous name to be their commission, and so it was Thorpe. Jim Thorpe died in 1953, and he never got his medals back while alive. Um, though, as you can see on the right there, in a partial kiss and make up, in 1983, the IOC rethought their position, and they gave duplicate gold medals to Thorpe's family. Um, he wasn't really, uh, yeah, um, he wasn't officially put back in the record book then, but they just gave duplicate medals to his, to his kids. And then a few years later, you know, after 1992, when the IOC started to allow professionals at the Olympics, and boy, did Olympic fans love watching professional athletes in the game. Think Michael Jordan in 1992. The IOC made the decision to put Thorpe's name back in the record book. Um, though in a weird move, they did not declare him the undisputed winner of his two events. Let me put this screen up. You can go to the IOC's website and search for the winners of any event in the Olympic Games. You just go to the year and you go to the event and you say, do you want to see men or women? And you get the, 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 the results. And up until 2021, if you search for the uh, results for the decathlon in 1912, here's what you saw. You saw that Jim Thorpe was a co-gold medalist with Hugo Wieslander. Wieslander had originally won silver and then was elevated to, to gold when Thorpe's medals were taken to him. Let the record show that back in 1913, when this story broke and the IOC stripped Thorpe of his gold medal, they tried to give it to Hugo uh, Wieslander, and he said, I'm not going to take it. That's Jim Thorpe's gold medal. I won the silver medal. Interesting that they didn't declare Thorpe the gold medalist outright. Uh, I like this quote here from Sally Jenkins of the Washington Post saying that this move made him an asterisk, not a champion. It was lip service, not restitution. Jim Thorpe won the gold. Go to the next year, 2022, and it's different. Uh, the IOC once again rethought their decision, and they made Thorpe the sole gold medalist uh, in, in his events. Now the IOC's website looks like this. Just so you know, this has everything to do with the racial justice movement that happened after the murder of George Floyd, a movement that even affected the world of sports. So uh, I think I'll stop there and I'm going to hope that we can have a robust conversation. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Andrews. I'm actually going to call you Matt because you said I could as we chat. Uh, and so I'm going to reclaim the host here. It's back to me. And I know we're going to get some great questions from great. our audience, but let's start out a little bit by talking about the Olympics, because I know that is actually a passion for yours, uh, of yours. And I have heard you say that you think through sport, you can teach just about anything and, and everything. Uh, and I think you're proving that I've looked over your, your celebrate at uh, Chapel Hill and you certainly have a very impressive list there. I'd love, love to have had the chance to take one of your classes. Maybe someday I will. Uh, but let's start out. You had the opportunity and actually let me step back first. Let me say, thank you so much for being here. 
of course. one more time. Um, when I first contacted you about being part of, of our series this summer, you were so gracious to say yes, but let me know that you were actually had quite a full summer. You were traveling personally uh, in um, Africa, I believe, and then yes. you were leading the study abroad program here in July, and you were going to be in London, one of my favorite cities. And while you were there, you had a chance to go over to Paris to be part of that Olympic experience. It's not your first time, your second time. Yeah, I, I first attended the Olympics in 1984, the Los Angeles Games in 84. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. So my dad and I drove down and we watched a ton of basketball. Uh, the U.S. had a great team. Patrick Ewing, uh, Chris Mullen, Michael Jordan, uh, yep. Bobby Knight was the head coach. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was pretty impressive. Uh, so coming back now, now in, in, in 2024, and as a historian of sport yeah. in the Olympics and with the students to see it through only your eyes, but to see it to see the Olympics through the eyes of these young people. Um, I, I just want to ask you a few questions about how that might have yeah. changed your perspective on the Olympics. Sure. And first setting up the idea that I love the Olympics. I, I think, I bet many of our viewers with us tonight, like me, were glued to their TV screens yeah. and their phones and all of their devices watching the games. Of course, I root for fellow Olympians, fellow Americans in the Olympics, but I love a good story, not just Americans. I root for the underdogs yeah. and those athletes who I have, all of them, I, it seems to me, have worked so hard and sacrificed so much. Yes, they were given great talent, but they have worked hard to bring it to the peak of its ability, and they're showcasing it for our enjoyment. You would have liked Jim Thorpe very much then. He's, yeah. He definitely fits um, that bill. And out of the Olympic spirit, as you said, the idea is to bring the world together, unify us. In fact, I think the theme is stronger, faster, higher, together. Yeah. Okay. Um I love the idea. I support it entirely. But if I were setting up a way to do that, I'm not sure I would have chosen sports. Uh, the, the sports, is a, a by its very nature, is competitive, has winners and losers. Is that yeah. the most unifying medium to bring people together? Well, it's the one that that the people care about the most, right? I mean, we could have um, you know a math conference or a history conference or an exchange ideas, but no one gets <laughs> excited about that. But no, um, Michelle, you're, you're hitting on what I think is in some ways the central paradox of the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games were created by the International Olympic Committee to ease international tensions. I mean, it wasn't to, to let's play sports. It was let's use sports to ease international tensions. But by making that decision that all athletes have to represent nations and that nations will then be there, you know, you can make the case that what the Olympics um, really do, they don't ease international tensions, but they exacerbate existing tensions. And there are a lot of examples, you know, since 1896 of nations in conflict with each other. And when their athletes come together, their athletes don't necessarily hug each other and say, let's forgive and forget. They sometimes trade trade punches. So it's a it's a it's a gamble. Um, and it both both has worked in some ways. But there are times when it doesn't work. And that's really the reason why Russia wasn't at the games this time. The Olympics wanted no part of Ukrainian and Russian athletes, you know, meeting in some sort of athletic contest. What would happen No, So there's a there's a paradox and there's a tension there. There's no doubt about it. I was going to say, there have been cases where the Olympics have been used to make political points, clearly, oh, we, yeah. as you just said, that was yeah. neither, that was not, that may have been the most recent case, but it was certainly not the first. How successful has it been to use the Olympics as a political persuader, in your opinion? Yeah, um, unsuccessful. You know, I think about when the United States boycotted the uh, Moscow Games in mm -hmm. 1980. What did it do? You know, look, I get it. I, I, I understand why, why, why Jimmy Carter decided he just could not be a part of Moscow's Olympics, of the propaganda that comes with hosting the Olympics. I don't think it was the right move, but I understand the, uh, the move. But did it do anything? Did it change anything? Did it get the Soviets out of Afghanistan? You know, in the case of Russia, there are those who say, actually, all this is doing is solidifying Putin's control of Russia. Um, he can say, see, the whole West is against us. The West, this is what I've been telling you. Uh, the West is against us. They won't even let us play play sports anymore. So I think that using the Olympics as a political tool, I think it's very dangerous. I don't think it's very effective. I understand why why people do it, um, but I just don't think it's the right strategy. All right. Uh, just a few more Olympic questions. We're starting to get some great Jim Thorpe questions. I'll throw your way in a minute. Again, if you want to send us a question, use that chat function and I'll share them with Matt. Um, I know you love sports. You mentioned that you have been before to the sports, to the Olympics. You've been now a second time. Did 
the second experience was clearly every experience would be different. But yeah. as now a historian, uh, a scholar, an academic, and a student advisor looking at the games through their eyes, okay. has has your feelings about the Olympics and its ability to unify people, has that at all changed? Yeah, so I, I should say this. Um, so I like the Olympics too. I get excited for them. The Olympics every four years is part of the the, the cycle of life, right? Um, I was bereft in 2020 when there were no Olympics, you know, and all we were doing was sitting around in our houses because of because of COVID. But I got to say, as a historian of the Olympics, I'm a pretty big critic of the Olympic Games. I'm a critic of the IOC. Um, I'm a critic of the immense amount of money that it costs to to host the Olympic Games. There are some recent examples like uh, uh, Athens, Greece and Rio, Brazil of hosting the Games, just gutting the e economy. I'm a critic of the way the IOC polices gender in some issues. Um, I'm a critic of the environmental ruin that comes along with hosting the games. I'm a critic of the, in Paris where I was, which was great. They forcefully cleared out the unhoused population. You know, they, they, they rolled through that city and they took homeless people and they just shipped them somewhere else. Um, and I'm a critic of all those things. So, and I still am. So I actually thought when I went to the Olympics, I'd be, um, the snarky academic and I'd sneer and I just said, yeah, this is exactly what I thought it was going to be like. Oh, and then I got there and I was with these 20 UNC students and they had the time of their lives. And I, I think the way you put it is great. Seeing it through their eyes, really, I'm not going to say it's not, um, you know, forget and forgive with the Olympic movement because I still hold grudges, but I get it now. I, 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 I'm, I'm actually kind of a critic of the, of the national identities. I, I know people like the national identities. I know it's what makes it popular. I just don't think that nationalism is always the best thing. I think nationalism can be problematic in in in, in many instances. But we went to that volleyball match I was telling you about. And by the end, me and my students, we were dancing with Italians over here and Poles over here. And, you know, we were singing American songs. And it, it really did what the Olympics said that they do, that I kind of but no, they don't actually do that. They bring people together. And I saw it firsthand. And so I'm trying to not be a true believer in the Olympics all of a sudden. I feel like I have to be a critic of the games, but it's very difficult after what I just experienced in Paris. Right. You mentioned um, while you have a softening of your uh, thoughts about and certainly an, an enjoyment of the Olympic Games themselves, you still have criticisms of the IOC. And I have an, an IOC question has come up that I want to okay. get your thoughts on. Sure. Uh, it is from uh, James here in Sanford, North Carolina. And he said that he was actually at the London 2012 Olympics. Cool. And he has recently come back from Paris 2024. So he's got, you've got two Olympic Games, Jill's got two Olympic Games. Uh, did you he wanted to know uh, if you are aware that there's a town in Pennsylvania named after Jim Thorpe. That's yeah. first. And then second, he mentions Pierre de Coupertin, who yeah. I believe was head of the, the IOC yeah. around that time of Jim mm -hmm. Thorpe's career mm -hmm. or when the decision was being made about yeah. the medals. And he right. um, wondered if you're aware of his thoughts, Mr. Coupertin's thoughts yeah. about what happened to Jim Thorpe and how involved or even aware of what was happening because you said this was really the American Olympic Committee yeah. was making the push mm -hmm. of what they were of the whole situation at that time. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, the question about the town of Jim Thorpe. Yeah, I'm aware of the town, you know, this town of Jim Thorpe was created to get tourists to go to this town, to this town that Jim Thorpe has never set foot in his his <laughs> entire life. It's like a it's like a tourist trap. Um and they did something very successful. They they got Jim Thorpe's wife to sell them Jim Thorpe's remains when Jim Thorpe died, and that's where Jim Thorpe is buried. Uh, that's not where Jim Thorpe's family say he should be buried. They want him back in Oklahoma, where he's where where he's from. It, that, that issue recently went all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, and Jim Thorpe remains buried in Jim, Jim Thorpe. So I've never been there. Um, <laughs> if, if I'm ever driving by it, I'm definitely going. I want to go visit Jim Thorpe's Thorpe's grave. Yeah, got to do it. Put it on the on the sports list. Yeah, as far as Cooper Tan, so it's really interesting. Coubertin is the head of the IOC, and so he's the one who who says we're, we're 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 going to have amateurism. The reason why he did it is that he wanted the English to be a part of the Olympic Games, and the English the English invented modern sports. All of our ideas about modern sports, most of the sports we play here in the United States, come from England. Coubertin knew that he had to have English leadership 
um, English sportsmen in the IOC. And they absolutely insisted on amateurism. Amateurism is an English idea. It became a transatlantic idea, but it's an English idea. Coubertin later said in his writings that he thought the whole um, insistence on amateurism was silly, that it was silly and it was messy and it just didn't make any sense. And so, though I don't know about him speaking specifically about Thorpe, I'm sure he would have been, um, you know, sympathetic to Thorpe's plight. I mean, it, what, what, what the IOC was realizing is all, there were a lot of athletes that were out there that weren't actually amateurs. You know, there was a, um, Kubertan stepped down from the IOC in 1924 as as president. And at the 1924 games, there was a Finnish runner named Pavo Nurmi, just one of the all time great runners. And Pavo Nurmi would go around and just get thousands of dollars as appearance fees to 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 run races. Everyone knew it was happening. They just couldn't quite quite prove it. The IOC eventually, right before the 1932 Olympics, banned Pavo Nurmi. They didn't strip him of any of his past medals. And he had a lot. But they said, you're not an amateur anymore. We're just not going to let you come compete. That was after Coubertin had left. So I suspect had it been up to Coubertin, Coubertin would have just, um, you know, followed the rules, actually said there's a 30 day period and the 30 days have passed. So we're just going to drop it and we're going to move on, you know, maybe ban him from future games. The next games were scheduled for Berlin in 1916. Those did not happen because of because of World War One. But I guess to, to the point of James's question, Cooper Tan found the insistence on amateurism uh, by the end of his tenure to be a, a little overwrought. Oh yeah, I think you're you're muted, Michelle, or maybe I am. Yep. No. Yep. No, I am. Thank you. See, told you first time, but I'm yeah, getting yeah. better. Uh, right. I'm going to let's let's transfer to Jim Thorpe. You were talking about Jim. Let's stay on Jim Thorpe for just a little bit. Um, a question that came up, and I think it's a valid one to ask. Um, we talked about what if you have and I introduced it as Jim Thorpe was a remarkable all around athlete, arguably yeah. the greatest of his time and maybe still one of the greatest. Yeah. But someone said, how do you even define that? What does that yeah. mean to be the greatest and who gets to determine that? No offense to Mr. Thorpe, but that's an interesting point to this guy. No, no, it, it's a it, it's a great question. Who gets to determine it? Oh, I don't know. We're just going to argue about it, right? That's what makes it makes it fun. We all get to de determine it. Um, I'm 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 wondering if secretly they're asking me who do I think is the greatest athlete <laughs> of all time. So that's what I'm going to go for. Um, yes, I'm gonna tell give us you, that. <laughs> I'm going to give you four names. So, so Jim Thorpe is 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 one of them because of what he does in the Olympics. You know, some of the events that he competed in in the decathlon. Had he competed in those individual events in the Olympics, he would have won the gold medal in those events too. You know, that, that doesn't happen in the decathlon. You're not the best 100 meters or the best shot putter. You're the best, you know, all around athlete. But Thorpe was so much more than that. You got Jackie Robinson and Jackie Robinson, not only for his courage, and here's where what is greatest, is it just athletic or is it something else? But Jackie Robinson was an unbelievable all-around athlete. Baseball was his worst sport. Jackie Robinson was an All-American football player at UCLA. He led the Pac-6 in scoring in basketball. He was the national champion long jumper. You know, he would have gone to the Olympics in 1940 had the Olympics happened in, in 1940. He could have been a professional basketball player, football player. He ended up just being a professional baseball player. So he's in the, in the conversation. You've got to put Will Chamberlain in the conversation because we've never seen an athlete like Will Chamberlain. Um, <laughs> Will Chamberlain wasn't just, he was fast. He could jump. He's in the basketball hall of fame. He's in the volleyball hall of fame. I mean, Will Chamberlain has never really seen a specimen. I don't like using that, that, that word actually with, with Chamberlain, but boy, was he a, a, a remarkable athlete. And then maybe the greatest American athlete of all was Mildred Babe Didrikson. Um, from from Beaumont, Texas, mm -hmm. who who could do anything? Um, she was, you know, she she was a great swimmer. She was she played the sports that girls weren't supposed to play, and she played them better than the boys in her high school: football, boxing, wrestling, track. It, in 1931, she entered a team track and field competition, and there was all these teams, and she was one person. She was a team of one. And she won the national championship in track and field all by herself. And then she went to the Olympics and she won a couple of golds and there was a disputed silver medal. And then 
She went on to be maybe the greatest female golfer of all time. I took up golf because it was one of the few things that women could, could, could do. She founded the LPGA, or she's the organizing force behind it. Tragically died of breast cancer way, you know, really, really young. But boy, I mean, I'm not sure I can think of a, you add it all up. I, I might have to go with Mildred Babe Dittrickson. Well, that's interesting that you bring her into conversation. And I'm glad you did, because honestly, I might have left her off a list. And that was on me. Um, she was so famous in her day that she became, she was, a, I'm going to use the word celebrity. Yeah, yeah, but as you said with many of them, that in ways that transcended sports, yeah. there is a famous film and I'm, I'm having a, a moment where I can't remember the name, but it is a, a Catherine Hepburn, Spencer Tracy film mm -hmm. where Catherine Hepburn is a female athlete and Babe Dickerson has a, has a more than a cameo. I've yeah. seen that where she and, and Catherine are talking and, and competing in golf. And right. she was introduced as someone who everyone watching that film would know right. and recognize. There was no yeah, need to introduce who, who she who was. was. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and interestingly enough, while Jim Thorpe never starred in a film, there was a film made about his life. So yeah. I'm just thinking of that Hollywood connection there for a minute. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are these these athletes who 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 transcend sports and mm -hmm. Jim Thorpe is one of them. And you know, now we have documentaries and we get the Michael Jordan documentary rather than a movie about Michael Jordan, you know, and some so, so well, I guess we just had yeah. air. He was sort of in that movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in the documentaries, I think about some of the Olympic athletes. I believe Simone Biles has one that's on yes. Netflix currently. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and some others. Great. You know, and, and Jim Thorpe. We, where we're talking about this, you know, who's the greatest? It is a personal opinion game, but it is difficult to, ex as, tr as difficult as it is to be a successful athlete in a single sport. And that is not easy as someone who's unathletic in every way. It's, it, you, <laughs> I believe, I believe that you have an innate ability that you are born with, but you have the perseverance, the dedication, the will to hone that ability, to practice and hone yeah. it. That's what the truly great athletes, yes, there's a gift, but they have worked to bring it to the forefront. And that's true in a single sport, but to do it in multiple sports, to, to succeed at the level he did. I mean, think about, you know, before Bo Jackson, before Deion Sanders, yeah, which was a multi-sport star, we saw Michael Jordan, who we all know and love, and you've mentioned, had perhaps arguably on that list of greatest basketball players of all time. But when he tried to have make his uh, mark in the Major League Baseball, baseball. Didn't yeah. have that same level of success. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it speaks to. I think it's one of the shames about the way our, our sports culture has emerged is that we we really just kind of, um, you know, what what sport is my kid best at, or what sport does my kid have the best opportunity to get a college scholarship in, and then it's that sport. You know, these remarkable athletes, a lot of them are ones who played all sports, all sorts of sports. But now it's you know. You want to play soccer, you're traveling every spring and every summer and every fall. You don't have time for other other sports. So we're, I'm just not sure we're going to get these 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 multi sport you know, geniuses uh, like we like we used to. And, and that's where the decathlon, the pentathlon, because they allow they are looking for the best overall athlete in the in the sports that they um record yeah yeah and the decathlon itself used to be a much bigger deal you know everyone the decathlon was considered the greatest athlete in the world uh, when jim okay. thorpe did it or when bob matthias did it for the united states in the that 40s on a Wheaties box. <laughs> yeah right right but 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 now uh you know everyone just wants to watch the hundred meters including me you know that's one of the things i wanted to see when i was in paris i got to be in the house for the men's hundred meters um we've have forgotten about the about the the virtuosity of the decathletes i think just back to the film very quickly, we had a question about how that was received. Uh, I can't actually remember how successful that film was. Burt Lancaster played yeah. Jim Thorpe. And then yeah. she reminded me in brown face because that was done in Hollywood. Yes. This was made in the in the 50s, I believe, wasn't that film? And yeah, that would have been in the 50s, uh, maybe the late 40s. It was mm -hmm. it was fairly successful. I don't know how it was received. I know I re have recently seen it by recently. I mean, like in the last 10 years, it's unwatchable actually, mm -hmm. um, because of how much they simplify the story, um, how much they make Jim Thorpe to be someone, um, just a very one-dimensional character, and Burt Lancaster with brown makeup all over him. It, it, from, from our modern sensibilities, it's just almost impossible to watch. Yep. But if there was ever someone whose life was made for a film, it may yes. have been Jim Thorpe's. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, he as you said, was born in Oklahoma. He had a twin brother, I understand, who they were very close. Um, Jim was a bit of the rebellious child. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Brother, his brother was more yeah. of the uh, more traditional, the one that sort of kept him in line. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, he died 
uh, when he was only I think nine years old and really yeah, sure in many ways Jim's life which had not been easy before started to unravel at 14 his mother died in childbirth and then the decision to go I think at 17 is when he initially went to Carlisle to he's start. basically sent to reform school mm -hmm. he's run away he, repeatedly throughout his childhood uh tried while at Carlisle he did, finds out his father has died of gangrene poisoning yeah that's right from a hunting accident uh so he's he's an orphan before he's 20 totally an orphan with no siblings no parents 20 years old yeah. had felt i'm sure very alone in the yeah. world and sports was a way perhaps for him to make connections um he seems to have enjoyed and i'm no expert but being part of the team experience very much i think football was perhaps his favorite sport even though that may not be the one he's most famous for today right, right. yeah um, and there is a, a story, I'm not sure if it's true. I would love to know that Jim Thorpe's daughter, he had he had eight children, I understand, um, from multiple, more than from three marriages. While visiting one of his daughters in New York, this is near the end of his life, um, and he had to ride the bus to come up and see her. Um, I, he was going to go back and do a speaking engagement, again, taking the bus back to the site. She, she took him to the bus station, which had a TV going. And what was playing on the screen was... The Jim Sort story. Wow. And she took a picture of him supposedly standing next to that screen. And yeah. his suit is a little tattered and worn. And you can see that here's this great, tremendous athlete, but is struggling. Is struggling. Yeah. Yeah. It, tried to make a little money in Hollywood, could only get roles uh, at really, you know, stereotypical Indian roles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. America wasn't kind to, to Jim Thorpe in the second half of his life. And while athletes may have been well known, they certainly did not make the kind of money they do no. today, professional athletes. Right. And, and it was still not entirely a, an accepted career, except it may be some of the more traditional type of sports, golf, yeah, tennis, it, perhaps. Jesse Owens came back from the Olympics in Berlin in 1936, and he couldn't monetize what 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 he had done. That was for the Babe Ruths. That was for the Lou Gehrig's. That was for the white athletes back then. It's not really going to be until the 1980s that 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 black 70s with oj simpson that that you know athletes of color are going to be able to monetize their success talking about jim thorpe's the end of his life he did you feel in any ways he ever recovered fully from the scandal um yeah i don't know i just know what i i guess from reading david Mor moranis's recent book um and it's a it's the it's a portrait of a of a wounded person um mm -hmm. You know, this was the it, it's the it's the thing that everyone always thought about Jim Thorpe when they when they saw him rather than his Olympic victories, rather than that amazing football victory over Army that I was talking about. Again, think of the symbolism of, of the Carlisle Indians beating Army uh, in 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 1912. So, no, it it, it seems like that it, that it stayed with him forever. Um, it's a you know. We want our sports stories to be nice. We want them to be uplifting. We want them to have happy endings. But I don't think the Jim Thorpe story has that. No, uh, he he did struggle. I understand with alcoholism as oh, well yeah. in his yeah. life, and so it, it was challenging in many ways. Yeah. The um, there's another question, and you may not know this. This is completely new information to me. But one of our viewers is asking if you have heard about this fact. Okay. Um, she has a rec. Oh, sorry, he uh, Ed Barrows has a recollection of hearing that Jim Thorpe's daughter was speaking in Wilson back in the 1960s. And she was at that time advocating for Native American rights. Have huh, you heard anything about this story? No, no, I don't know anything about that. I would be surprised uh, Thorpe's family, some of his kids did become activists uh, later on. I mean, one of their chief uh, uh, avenues of activism was to get their father's medals back. I mean, they they fought for that over and over and over. So I, I don't know that. I. I have no reason to doubt it. It wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, I imagine North Carolina would be one of the states that that um, that a Native American right, uh, rights activist would be spending a lot of time in in the 60s and 70s. Absolutely. Um, talking about the effort to get the medals back, it was the family, I understand, who were so yeah. involved in that. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. The, the family made it a crusade and they were endlessly frustrated. You know, um, you had U.S. presidents, uh, Gerald Ford declared... Jim Thorpe Day, you know, and, and and basically asked for Jim Thorpe's medals to come back. You know, the reason why they 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 came back, I think mean, one of it, 83, what's happening in the United States Olympic-wise in 1984, 
Los Angeles, where Jim Thorpe, you know, kind of lived out the end of his life. Uh, it was a pub. It was a PR move. It was the right move, I think. But it was it was a PR move. Um, and then again, the the the, the IOC really um, the, they came to a crossroads at the end of the '80s and the and the start of the '90s when they decided that they were gonna they wanted pro professional athletes to be in the the Olympics. That changed everything. You know, there was new leadership. Avery Brundage, who I mentioned, was a fierce defender of amateurism, absolutely fierce. I mean, it drove him endlessly nuts that people were getting money to wear shoes or that skiers had the names of ski uh, of the ski company on their skis. He was, you know, like battling windmills against against amateurism uh, at the end of his of his um, tenure. Um, we got more modern uh, uh, directorship of the IOC in the 80s with Juan Antonio Samaranch. Um, he is not not without sin. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. <laughs> but um, uh, Samaranch just realized that uh, people wanted to see the best athletes in the world. And more and more, the best athletes were professional athletes. And not just wanted to see the best athletes at the Olympics, wanted to see the same athletes kind of over and over amateurs couldn't go to multiple olympics they, they they had to get jobs to to support themselves so you see a sprinter once and that's it you're never going to see him again but think about you know usain bolt and three different olympics and michael phelps you know over and over simone biles these are names we all know and love and we feel like we know them because we see them year after year so uh they knew what they were doing and once they decided once they made that move started to seem a little hypocritical to have taken the medals away from Jim Thorpe for playing baseball in the summer mm -hmm. when he competed in track and field three years later. And so right. that's when the decision was made to, you know, probably get him back. That Pavo Nurmi, who I mentioned, who they, they kicked out of the Olympic movement, there's a statue of Pavo Nurmi in front of the IOC headquarters right right now. That's, that's how much the IOC has, you know, uh, changed their tune with regards to amateurism. In fact, one of our viewers mentioned seeing that statue. So <laughs> of, of Pablo Nurmi, yeah, yes. yeah. And what, the weirdest thing about the statue, the viewer probably noticed it, is that Pablo Nurmi is naked in that statue running. So, you know, ancient Olympians competed naked. So they're taking Pablo Nurmi and they've turned him into the, the, the sort of the vision of the ancient Olympic athlete. It's a it's an interesting trick that, that they played there. I have not seen that statue. You're making me a little less interested in seeing that statue. <laughs> no, it's, it's very tasteful. It's very tasteful. <laughs> Um, my understanding, and you um, may be able to say a little bit about this or, or just talk about to me, to add to this, this tragedy of what should have been a, a completely triumphant life yeah. in so many ways, or a, tri a person who triumphs over tra uh, uh, tragedy elements, he still goes on the resilience he had to have, um, and the difficulties in his, throughout his life, uh, health, emotional, uh, obstacles because of his heritage, because so much was going against him. But yeah. the medals finally come back to the family. And my understanding is that the children, the oldest surviving children, decide they should be in a museum, a local museum. Yeah. And at some point afterward, they are stolen. This is what I've heard. Yeah. And have never been recovered. Yeah. Uh, it's just kind of the cherry on top, isn't it? You know, again, they weren't the, um, the original gold medals or they were they were, mm -hmm. they were replicas although they would have been gold i mean if they were because they actually i think the gold medals were whole gold as late as 1912 although i'm not sure if that's what the replicas were yeah uh, this is what i've heard so it, it's just you know that along with with the with, with the fight over where jim thorpe's remains ought to be you know in a town that they're really kind of there for hokey reasons <laughs> rather than, than than reasons that have to do with heritage um, it's, uh, it's just sort of one, in, one indecency after another. Are you aware of, or have heard about any comments coming from his family now that the record books finally show him as the ultimate champion? Uh, just a very brief blurb that they're saying justice has finally been, mm -hmm. been, been done. Yeah. And it was a, it was a long, long battle. Um, you know, it's, it's complicated in the sense that Jim Thorpe definitely broke the rule of amateurism. I mean, he's, he's, he's guilty of the crime that he was accused of. Um, it's just that there were ways around it. There were tricks of the trade and, and Jim Thorpe didn't play that game. Mm -hmm. Um, he broke the rules yet. He was honest about breaking the rules, but he was honest <laughs> about breaking the rules. And <laughs> he again, suffered. The, the reason why I spent so much time on, on, on James Sullivan is I really think he's the, in some ways he's, he's not more important than Jim Thorpe, but he's almost as important as important as Jim Thorpe um, in this character. 
you know, James Sullivan is an unsavory individual for a lot of reasons. Um, the anthropology days, which I talked about, his ideas about racial hierarchies, which I talked about. He loathed female athletes, um, female Olympians. You know, in 1912, the, the Stockholm Games, women were allowed to swim and dive and compete in gymnastics, but not American women, because James Sullivan said, no, those sports are unfemale. That's a direct quote, where I'm not gonna let American women compete in those sports. Um, to this day, the Sullivan Award is given to the nation's outstanding amateur athletes. Um, Caitlin Clark has won it the last two years. It's actually a great list if you go and look at all the all the, all the Sullivan Award winners. It's named after James Sullivan um, because he was the founder of the Amateur Athletic Union, or one of them, and the and the and the and the the, the national police officer for 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 amateurism. But you know, had it been up to the IOC, had it been up to to the Swedish Olympic committee sullivan once said that he that he went after thorpe because the brits were complaining about uh, american athletes not being amateurs the british olympic committee was fine with thorpe keeping his his medals you know th there's a there's a tragic protagonist in this story and there's a villain and i know people are more complicated than that but it, in this story i just think that james sullivan is the villain you know, Sullivan, though, was no longer in charge by the time when the medals were returned. So why did they not go ahead and correct the record books at that time or make the correct, you know, list yeah, for, yeah, as the um, sole winner of the game? Yeah, they, the IOC doesn't like rewriting history, although they do it all the time, actually. But yeah, I, I just think it has to do with this idea of the sanctity of the record book. You know, baseball has the has the same issue with the sanctity of the record book. Um, we're going to have to put an asterisk here or, 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 or there for, you know, Roger Maris or Barry Bonds or, or whatever. I think it's, it's generally speaking, that's a semi obtuse answer, but I think that's generally speaking what the answer is. I'm going to start closing, but I do have just a little bit more for you and I appreciate everyone's time. Um, couple of things I just wanted to embrace. Going back to that 1912 Olympic team, yeah. I, I'm really taken aback by the talent and the diversity as we spoke about. And I think it's just worth reminding many of our viewers what was going on or what life was like for those athletes outside of the sports arena in 1912 America. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, um, that, that's a great question. And I, or we can go to uh, Jesse Owens in Berlin mm -hmm. in, in 1936. You know, it's interesting. There were some nations at the Olympics, like South Africa, for example, that did not let athletes of color compete for them. Um, all the way until the 90s, black South Africans could not compete for South Africa in the Olympic games. Um, South Africa was consistent in their rules about race in South Africa and in the Olympic games. Uh, it's a bad consistency, but they were consistent. The United States was not. The United States had a tendency of denying Native Americans and African Americans uh, uh, civil rights in the United States, but then started to realize we can use these exact same athletes for international glory. Which one's better? Which one's worse? You know, I I, I don't know. When um when when Jesse Owens and thirteen other black athletes went to Berlin in 1936. The Nazis called them athletic auxiliaries, meaning the United States doesn't give African-American civil rights back at home, something we Nazis applaud, um, but then they're not consistent and they use them for international glory in sports. You know, there's a hypocrisy with the United States and how they use athletes of color in international competition. Say what you will about the Nazis and we can say an awful lot, an awful lot. It's kind of a fair critique of how the United States was, was doing business back then, you know, not letting Jim Thorpe do this or do that or Jesse Owens do that, but we will gladly use you to win gold medals and win the medal count. And, you know, and this is going to be something that, that that plagues the United States Olympic Committee all the way until the end of the civil rights. I mean, Tommy Smith and John Carlos are going to raise their fists in 1968 saying we still have a race problem in the United States. Um, you know, it, it's all part of the same same story. As you said, when um, when it comes to how our representation or image on the world stage, we send our best regardless of who they yeah. are or how we may perceive of them. I'm speaking as the nation, how we yeah. may perceive of their humanity and citizenship. Yeah. Because at that time, um, Native Americans were not considered most, for the most part, U.S. citizens. Uh, oh, you no, they, they Hawaii yeah. was not a state. 
there were issues there. We certainly would know about Jim Crow in the South for yeah. the African American athletes. Boston Catholics also experienced a great deal of discrimination sure. within their communities. And yet, and, and Jewish Americans, and many of these groups still do. I'm not saying yeah. it's gone away, but when you look at that makeup of that team, it it's very it's very interesting about what that says in this conversation we're having. Yeah, and, so and that it was happening so much earlier. The diversity in sports was happening much earlier than we might have thought, not necessarily for the best reasons. And yeah. how did any of that may have helped some of that? And, I, and I'm not even going to open this sadly because our time is almost out. Oh, okay. What no, no, that might have, unless you have something you want to add. How is the issue? How does that help some of these social justice movements? I, I mean, I really want to know, but I'm. That's another hour, probably, right? That's a big question. I teach an entire <laughs> course, and we try to figure out the answer to that question. So that's it. I have to take your course so that we can come back and have that conversation. Sounds All good. Right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to close this my final question. Uh, I'm going to come full circle back to the Olympics and your experience or thoughts. Mm -hmm. We opened with Olympic questions, so okay. it seems appropriate to close with an Olympic question. Um, I think most of our viewers probably know this. If you watch the recent games, you certainly saw this coming up. The In 2024, the Olympics come back to America. They're coming back to LA for the summer game. 2028, apologize. 2028, the Olympics yeah. return to America for LA. You're a native Californian, yeah. a lover of the sport. You've seen two games now. Um, you have a changing direction a little bit, but <laughs> are you looking forward to those games? And do you have a lot of confidence about LA's ability to pull them off successfully? Uh, I do have a lot of confidence about LA pulling them off s successfully. And the reason why is that the um, American cities like Los Angeles have amazing sports infrastructure. And they don't have to build anything for the Olympics. It's already there. And that's the problem with the Olympics. When they go to a city, every all these cities deserve the opportunity to have the games. But it just doesn't make any sense when you have to spend $20 billion, billion to build sports arenas. LA has got UCLA and USC. They've got arenas for football and basketball. I mean, it's just all there. Very few things are going to have to be tinkered with or or, or, or done outside. So I think uh, they can absolutely pull it off. I think there's a high bar. I think Paris seems special to a lot of people. Look, Paris is special. I mean, <laughs> that's what a great city Paris is. And the one thing I got to say, you know, being there, the best part of being in Paris for the, the Olympics, and maybe James experienced the, the same thing. You go to the events and they were fun and they were loud and they were crowded, exactly what they ought to be. And then the rest of the city was just empty. All the things you wanted to do that that you normally can't do in the summer because it's so crowded, there was no one there. So it was just perfect. So will they be as, as great as that? Here, here's the number one problem uh, with an American city hosting, with, with Los Angeles hosting the games, public transportation. Mm. Um, we don't have it in LA. Um, yeah, there are buses. There's a, there are a couple subway lines, but it's not like Paris. It's not like London. Boy, when I, I seriously, when I think back to 1984, the Los Angeles games, I think about watching Michael Jordan play basketball, and I think about sitting in the car in traffic for three hours just to go anywhere. Um, and that's my fear for the Los Angeles games. Um, do I want to go? Yeah, I definitely want to go. I, I definitely want to be there. <laughs> Well, I hope we won't have to wait until 2028 to have you back with us here at the okay, Museum of right. History talking about sport. Thank you so much again. Um, I've enjoyed this, even though we've obviously talked about some lows and some very tremendous injustices done against Mr. Thorpe. Yeah. Hopefully he's resting in peace now because his legacy is in some ways starting to be restored. I don't know that yeah. it can ever be fully restored because of all those years, but he's getting the the recognition he truly deserved uh, and as finally. And, and we're so grateful for that. So thank you for being with us. That includes our wonderful audience who was here tonight and stayed with us to learn more about this story. A little known fact, how North Carolina connected with one of the greatest athletes and changed his life. Unfortunately, not always, not for the better, but uh, changed his life forever. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, and of course you did, uh, then you might want to visit us here at the Museum of History. Come to our webpage at ncmuseumofhistory.org, and you can learn about the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame. It features more than 200 items representing 363 Tar Heel sports heroes, including many with Olympic ties. And I'm going to show uh, mention just a few of the things that you can see there uh, online right now. Driver Richard Petty's stock car, Metal Arc Lemon's Harlem Globetrotters basketball uniform, NC State University coach Katie Yao's Olympic team basketball, 
uh, Charlie Shushu Justice's UNC Chapel Hill football jersey, and Mike Krzyzewski's Duke University warm-up jacket. Probably not the one he wore when he was part of the Olympic basketball team as one of the coaches there, but still another great tie to sports, North Carolina, and the Olympics. Also want to invite you to come visit us in November on Saturday, November 23rd. We are going to celebrate North Carolina's American Indian history. November is Native American month. You do not have to wait till November to celebrate Native American history. It can be celebrated all year round. And certainly that's appropriate in North Carolina. We have the second largest population east of the Mississippi, Native American population here. And we're gonna celebrate the history, culture, and achievements both historically and contemporarily at the 29th Annual American Indian Heritage Celebration. Details are going to be showing up on our webpage. It's free and come be with us. So again, until the next time that we can meet at the museum, I'm Michelle Carr and I wish you all a good night. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Anders. I can't say it oh. enough. I'm no, going to turn everything no. off and stop the recording. It's been a real pleasure. I hope yeah. you enjoyed it because I know yeah, it was fun. how busy you are and have been. And I, I very much appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, it's funny. This is my third lecture this. today. I'm oh. I'm tired. My <laughs> my voice is getting is getting hoarse. Well, then I'm going to let you go and okay. have some hot tea. Uh, and thank you for everything. Uh, I, again, I truly do hope we can have another talk sometime. Please reach out. Yeah, I love talking about sports. All right. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Bye, Michelle.